Good morning and welcome to ORF's Fellow Seminar Series. My name is Antara Khushal Singh. I'm a fellow at the Strategic Studies Program at ORF. Today, we will discuss a very timely and important paper on China's military civil fusion strategy by Dr. Manoj Joshi, who is a distinguished fellow at the ORF. As we know, China has set its goal to transform the People's Liberation Army into a world-class military by 2049 and lead the world in emerging and disruptive technologies by that time. And in achieving this vision, China's civil military fusion strategy is slated to play a very important role. China's military civil fusion strategy, which is also called the MCF strategy, has already been elevated as a national strategy in China in 2014. Um, and over the years, Beijing's increased focus to, uh, to break down barriers and create stronger linkages between its civilian economy and defense industrial base has started to draw considerable of, um, attention from world over. In fact, in any policy debate on China, its MCF strategy has evolved as one of the key issues for discussion and concern in various countries, including India. It is in this background, Dr. Joshi's paper uh, provides important understanding of the fundamentals as well as various facets of China's MCF strategy, the challenges it poses to uh, China-India relations, China-India military balance, um, and, uh, and of, of course, the overall relation between the two countries. To discuss Dr. Joshi's paper in further details, we have with us uh, Professor Amrita Jash, Assistant Professor, uh, Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, and Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar. So without further delay, um, we'll start with Dr. Joshi introducing his work on uh, China's MCF strategy uh, in the first 15 minutes. After that, our uh, panelists um, uh, will have 10 minutes each to discuss the paper. In the final 10 minutes, we can um, respond to the comments or questions, if any, and make our concluding remarks. So uh, let me request Dr. Joshi to take the stage and uh, present his research. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Singh. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Uh, and good evening to all of you. Uh, military civil fusion, you know, military modernization was the fourth and last of Deng Xiaoping's uh, four modernizations. Defense. But in Deng Xiaoping's time, the idea was defense conversion. China has always followed, uh, China was always being a kind of a national security state, has always seen civil military integration as an important concept in the sense that civil uh, sector must help the military sector. But by the time of uh, the opening up of China and Deng Xiaoping, the defense sector had become extremely huge and extremely uh, dominant in the whole setup. So Deng Xiaoping's aim was that he's going to uh, use defense conversion, that is to release defense over capacity for civilian use. Now, since the 1990s, the, the um, Chinese therefore uh, modified their civil military integration concept for defense spin-on and defense spin-offs. So we have, uh, you may have heard of uh, programs 863, uh, program 921, that is for the, uh, and program uh, 995, 863 was the defense conversion thing. It's called 863 because it is in, uh, on the third month of 1986 uh, that this was proposed. Likewise, there's 921, which, was, which um, took up the concept of manned uh, space flight. And 995 came after the bombing of the Chinese embassy in uh, Belgrade and uh, by the Americans. And this has, is what triggered off what China said was its uh, MCF kind of programs. In the 2000s, the notion of MCF began to emerge where the earlier notion of CMI was replaced by the concept of fusion, meaning civil military integration is one thing. Military civil fusion implied a situation where two plus two will be more than four in the sense that it's like a chemical reaction where two chemicals uh, interact and they create some uh, third element. So uh, fusion has a different uh, kind of an idea. But the CMI, uh, MCF, uh, what both they were embedded in the 2006 National Medium and Long-Term Plan for Development of SNT. It's called MLP. But the progress was slow. According to estimates, by 2010, less than 1% of civilian high-tech enterprises were involved in defense. 
So that was not at all uh, good progress, especially for the private sector, which was kept out. Now, in the Xi era, like India, China has been absorbing Western technology. So all of us missed out the, 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 the uh, technology development in the world. The Industrial Revolution took place in the West. And we colonial countries lost out, countries that had been colonized lost out. So we have been absorbing Western technology through a process, what you call IDAR, that is introduction, digestion, assimilation, and re-innovation. So introduction of a technology, then you digest the technology, then you assimilate it, and then you reach the capacity to re-innovate it. Now, behind this is a huge national effort that involved planning, investment, acquisition of technology, and acquisition of technology was through covert and overt means. And we know that the Chinese had the remarkable covert means. Um, and also, very importantly, dissemination of this technology to various competing laboratories. This strategy has gained salience since Xi Jinping came to power in 2012 and made it the state's key goal to transform PLA into a world-class military. So one of the important things of, of, of Xi Jinping's uh, arrival, then I said, the, you know, so the uh, I described the IDAR process, introduction, digestion, assimilation, and re-innovation, and the huge effort that has gone in, uh, you know, into getting the technology and getting the technology through overt means and covert means, disseminating it to various national laboratories. And under Xi Jinping, this gained salience. Xi Jinping came to power in 2012. And he made it the state's key goal to transform the PLA into a world-class military. And military-civil fusion as a strategy became the focus of this effort. And it was designated as a national strategy in 2014. Now, China sees MCF as a master strategy that must be amalgamated with other national strategies of economic development. China has adopted a whole of society effort for leadership in AI, artificial intelligence, in new and advanced materials and new energy technologies. All the effort is to trigger advances in other technologies with consequent economic and military gains. Because you know, technologies like artificial intelligence are enabling technologies, meaning if you master artificial intelligence, you, it can enable advances in other areas. So it is not just about technology, but a larger effort to strengthen military capabilities also not just with technology, but by deploying civilian talent and using commercial logistics as a guiding concept for China's approach to national defense mobilization. Now, background. As in many other areas, China's strategy is inspire, inspired by the American experience. Now, what the US has done from the 50s onwards, or actually from a long time back, the US has leveraged close relationship between its defense sector its academia and the private sector for military purposes. The United States Air Force, for example, promoted the CNC machines, the com computer numer numerically controlled machines were promoted by US Air. US Navy came up with the containerization concept, meaning this concept evolved under the auspices of the US Navy. DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research uh, Projects Agency, came up with the GPS the global positioning system and the internet, which we use, which freely use today, but began as military technologies. Now, today, the US fears that China is seeking to follow its example. It recognizes that technology has become the core of US-China uh, competition. While the US is ahead in most areas, there is no clear winner as yet in technologies such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing. So there are technologies, but these are such emerging technologies, very new technologies. So it's very difficult to talk of winners and losers out here because these are just about getting underway. But whatever it is, people see that, think that there's a potential that this can create a revolution in military affairs. So they are worried about these uh, the advances there. Now, looking at Chinese plans, so in its 14 five-year plan, uh, China explored for the first time development of disruptive technologies to close the gap with the US. That means technologies which could disrupt the US lead. So this is what the Chinese called assassin's mace technologies. So they could this, this could come up in things like quantum computing and communication, hypersonic weapons, um, 
other things driven by AI. So these could be, uh, you know, new and uh, technologies which would enable China, which is weaker than the US, to take on China. So the leadership for this, you know, has emerged uh, along with the presidency of Xi Jinping. From the outset, as I told you, the, uh, he has been advocating this, but there have been people within the PLA like Jiang Luming uh, since the mid 2000s who have been urging the um, military civil fusion. Uh, amongst the Chinese institutions, of course, you have the State Administration for Science, Technology, Industry for National Defense, SASTIND. So the, the charter of SASTIND incorporates the MCF uh, uh, development, MCF development plans. And this is under the Ministry of Information and Te uh, in, uh, Technology. In January 2017, the Central Commission for Integrated Military and Civil Development, CCIMCD, was set up and Xi Jinping was its chairman. This is essentially a very high powered coordinating body and whose membership comprises of just about the top most people, meaning deputy heads of this are Wang Huning and Hang Zheng, both are members of the Politburo Standing Committee. Now, the purpose of this commission is to provide apex level deliberation and decision making. Then amongst the Chinese institutions involved are the, is the CMC itself, the, the Central Military Commission. So when it was reorganized in 2016 and 2017, the uh, uh, Science and Technology Commission came directly under the CMC. In addition, in July 2017, a new Military Science Research Steering Committee was created. So this committee is in a pattern like DARPA, like the American uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which basically is more of a funding agency. It doesn't have its own labs or anything, but it directs funding to universities and such institutions. Now, they've all come together, led by the CCI MCD. And the SASTIND works, as I said, the CCI MCD works at the CPC level, the Communist Party of China level. SASTIND works at the PRC government level. And the CMC, uh, Science and Technology Commission, oversees it at the PLA level. And the MRSC, uh, MSRSC, uh, focuses on strategic technology guidance and designating key military technologies. Now, unrolling this, you know, the PLA, uh, National Defense University, uh, Academy of Military Sciences, uh, and the National University of Defense Technology are involved in this. They have played a very central role in this. Research centers have been created uh, to have civilians and PLA work together. This is unusual for China. Uh, State-owned enterprises like the China Aerospace Science Technology Corporation, China Aviation Industry Group, Norinco, and others are also involved uh, in this process. Now, at a meeting of the CCI MCD, she called for the creation of a rule-based system which would encourage private sector participation. That's an important uh, element in this. So discussion was to build up a fairer market environment, to push forward competitive procurement, to guide state-owned military industrial enterprises. There were also calls to, uh, to promote scientific technological innovation and to make breakthroughs in key uh, technology. Now, setting up uh, a part of this has been setting up military civil fusion industrial parks. You know, there is, for example, the Zhongshu, Zhongguan Chun Science and Technology Zone in Beijing. So, some 80 Chinese universities also, in addition, have been certified to undertake classified research. And in November 2017, a national team was formed to develop AI applications. So, you, who was there? Baidu, Alibaba iFly Tech, SenseTime, you know, from Hong Kong, uh, Tencent on medical diagnosis. So different uh, team was set up to promote AI there. Now the MCF has also been woven into the Made in China 2025 plan. The MIC 2025 plan to uh, make China uh, Atman Nirbhar in a whole range of areas. Uh, the, the, so this MCF has been woven into that. And a lot of this has come together, came together in the 13th National Five Year Plan, which ended last uh, in 2020, which was known as the Internet Plus Plan. And linked to this was the Artificial Intelligence Development Plan, which was announced in July 2017. And the plan named MCF as one of the six main duties in AI development. Now, the US response, of course, the US, as you know, till about 2017, followed a policy of engagement with China. It is only with the 
um, national security strategy of the Trump administration, that thing has, things have changed. And the US now sees itself in competition. So they are very worried that these key enabling technologies in AI or quantum computing could dramatically enhance China's military capabilities. So the, the US itself has launched what's called its third offset strategy. And they want to focus on advanced computing, big data, machine learning, AI, to create new powerful battle networks involving human machine collaboration. And of course, the important element of the US response is the technology denial regime, as far as China is concerned. In 20, as of 2018, Export Control Act came up, which have much more stricter um, rules with regard to China. In October 2020, um, the US and the Vassanar Agreement arrangement issued new controls on six recently developed or developing technologies. So these technologies, which are uh, very restricted for China now, include hybrid additive manufacturing, CNC tools, computational lithography software, technology for finishing wafers of five uh, nanometer production, digital forensic tools, software for monitoring communications, metadata from telecom providers and suborbital craft. So all these are very cutting edge technologies which China has a problem with. Implications for India, very simple. If the Chinese are targeting the US in their military civil fusion, obviously we will find it very difficult to, uh, and will be inevitably affected. So India needs to enhance its own uh, MCF, but first of all, it must get its military and civilian R&D in, and industry going. So India does have some uh, advantages in area like IT services, design, product, product engineering, but we don't have that kind of depth. What we really need is a mission approach and leadership provided by the prime minister himself. As I uh, indicated earlier that Xi Jinping has provided the leadership uh, to the uh, uh, Chinese process. And the reason is that when, you, when leadership is provided at the apex level, things get done. And we have seen this in the case of India, you know, both the uh, uh, nuclear power program and our space program, eventually the prime minister was the head of them, was, was, was the head of the organization. And because of that, we were able to make key breakthroughs. We also need very importantly to get our act together in terms of center stage coordination, because the states are, will have to be partners in this. We just can't, it can't be just the work of New Delhi. And, and most importantly, reforming our university system and taking the whole thing into a whole of the nation uh, approach. So, but fortunately, as of now, you know, MCF has just about gotten underway. Most analysts say it's too early to judge the military implications of the strategy. There are lots of big unknowns. So it's all right to talk of AI and quantum computing, but to actually see them in uh, weapon systems is, will take some time. The impact of sanctions on key areas is bound to have an effect on the Chinese. Their ability to accept certain high-end chips, certain high-level software. And the Chinese are aware of this. And they have, they have other problems with it in regard to their uh, public and private sectors. So we have seen recently the crackdown on the technology sector uh, in China, that's not going to be very helpful. So they have targeted the innovative private sector, you know, uh, Baidu, Tencent, ByteDance, Alibaba, you know, and the government has also been taking stakes in Sina Weibo and ByteDance. They may all that all, neither will be helpful. Now, there is no doubt that China is making a huge effort through large scale investments. But US analysts like uh, Elsa Kanya and Lauren Laskai say that a lot of it is aspirational and a lot of it is also, in my opinion, uh, there's an element of psyops involved in this. So basically, uh, as we have seen in the recent uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that though there is often talk of these dramatic military um, changes, dramatic the way that the military can uh, operate today, but the fact of the matter is the Russians have been operating in a fairly conventional manner and they've been checked in a fairly conventional manner. So some of these very cutting edge technologies, yes, they could have an impact in the future, but we are yet to know, uh, we are yet to understand that. But it is good to, uh, to, 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 to um, with, the, with, the, with the understanding, uh, try to mitigate potential consequences. So I'll just conclude here. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for that interesting presentation. Uh, now I will request uh, Professor Josh to make a comments. Thank you very much, uh, Antra. And uh, firstly, my compliments uh, to Dr. Joshi for articulating such a timely paper, which is not just topical, but also very significant. And India uh, needs to pay attention. So far, we see that MCF came into the picture and one man to be credited was uh, former states, uh, US State Secretary Mike Pompeo, who was very vocal about MCF. And that actually took, uh, uh, so credit goes to him. But given in the context that, you know, the times that we are living in and faced with uh, an Eastern Ladakh crisis was still going on, we need to pay far more attention as to what is happening in China and especially under MCF. Why I say so? Because so far we have seen it's mainly called civil military integration and uh, but China or rather Xi Jinping changed the very uh, uh, name of the game by make by putting military first. So if military is taking precedence over civil that calls for some red flags that what does it suggest? And uh, Dr. Joshi has very well articulated in the paper and so has already given a glimpse of the paper as what it can mean and what China has been doing so far. Now, uh, we see that how it got graduated when Xi Jinping uh, took the presidency. In 2013, he announced at the third plenum, he announced for or he put forward the interest towards a deeper civil military integration. We didn't see fusion coming into play, he called it integration. But in 2015, when he elevated uh, MCF into a national strategy, we see the change of words happening because the elevation can be traced from that of for like the transition that took place from calling it early state fusion to that of deep fusion. So from early state to deep fusion, this itself, the transition brings into perspective the significance that this strategy holds. And uh, we also see it. So the aim is to strengthen the PLA. So the PLA is at the foremost of the game and the civilian sector is aiding the PLA in doing so. So here again, the key word is the military and the precedence uh, is found in the very uh, idea of calling it military civil fusion rather than civil military fusion. So the intentions are very clear and we should not have any doubt about it that what China is intending to do. Now, the applicability part, it's very common that you know it's meant for dual use technology. So the intention therefore lies in leveraging not just technology, as I would like to uh, seek your attention. It's not just about leveraging technology, but also policies and organizations for the military benefit. Therefore, it becomes all encompassing. NCF, therefore, is an all encompassing strategy and which includes, as I would uh, like to enlist a few infrastructure national defense related to scientific and te technological industry, weapons and equipment procurement, and also uh, you know, manufacturing, talent cultivation, socialization of the support system for the military, and last but not the least, mobilization for national defense for integration of civilian and industries. So this brings in the broad picture that nothing is left out. When we say MCF, it can encompass anything under the sun, what Xi Jinping or China intends under its umbrella. So it's very much straightforward in, in the understanding. Now, what is the goal? Why are you aiming for an all-encompassing approach? It is very much the goal is to make the PLA, firstly, of course, uh, the world-class military. But I would, again, try to pay your attention, seek your attention towards what Xi Jinping said at the 19th Party Congress, that taking where China is going to take the center stage. So we have to bring in both these elements that, you know, taking the center stage and the world-class military. And the aim is that PLA has to be ever ready to not just fight, but win 
informationized local wars and now we see that it has further graduated to an intelligent warfare so the system of systems approach is very clear in this perspective so therefore when i say mcf it is much more it has three core elements that is a full element approach then there is multi domain approach and therefore what do you gain out of it so the returns need to be high and many scholars has put forward have, or amalgamated the belt and road approach in that mcf that you know belt and road plays a very vital role when we take a full element it's actually it's taking about all the sectors it takes into consideration your technology your organizations and policies so all three aspects and multi domain of course it's it's not just limited to land air and sea but we are talking about space we are talking about electromagnetic cyber so all so this domain again is ever expanding based on your threats so it can be any so there is it's open to uh, in it's an open uh, domain so which can ha have anything listed based on chinese perceptions and of course high returns are what does china want to seek and definitely china wants to have or maximize the div dividends as much as possible so there is no possibility of losing or relative gains but rather it has to be a win win for china when it talking of mcf so both the arms or like you know both these elements the military and civil has to be in uh, sync with each other but and where the gains can be a total absolute uh, absolute in nature so when we have this broad picture and sir has already discussed that how china is utilizing it or or facilitating this approach now for us being in india uh, the concerns uh, we need to take heed of the concerns that it poses like yes china is trying to match united states of course if you want to match a power like united states india just becomes a case walk for china and that's where we as uh, 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 as indians or the strategic community or the armed forces need to take cognizance of the fact that how does the strategy pose a concern so here uh, mcf as would like to argue that it poses a concern mainly uh in terms of as a security challenge and so it's not just about the united states but to its neighbors especially neighbors with which china is at odds and to that india figures uh very much in the picture and now india has also become or there's a change in perception in chinese perception that it does see china india as a potential threat so if that is uh, uh that is the ground so it does mcf does hold greater concerns from india as well so what makes it a concern is since technology is key now the access of technology that it, it can be accessible to anyone under the qrc jurisdiction so this becomes a concern because then anyone or data in case of china and its engagement with other countries it is mainly aimed at augmenting beijing's military ambitions or expansion tendencies where it's not just its own uh, populace that's a, there is a warrior in its uh, populace but also in its engagements with other countries like who are china's allies in this picture so that also brings in the larger gamut of things that how mcf can be played out and we are seeing that you know if if we take into consideration india very much the port facility activities which we try to call it as uh, encirclement of india very much falls under mcf so if you see uh, gwadar or hampuntota or where or uh, cpec for that matter is very much a part of mcf so that clarifies why india needs to be concerned because what it intends to do and why the concerns loom large is because mcf is so open ended there is no clear cut definition to it there is no straight jacketed ways we can 
assess China's intentions. So China is playing on the opacity. And so we need to read much deeper in between the lines when it comes to China's ambitions uh, or intentions with relation or in relation to MCF. Now, as research or R&D forms one of the major part of uh, MCF, we need to see the change in China's uh, a way of doing things. China being an authoritarian state, we're seeing that the private enterprises are coming up. Uh, so far, we saw state-owned enterprises, but now private players are becoming out acting as key players in facilitating MCF. And we are seeing civilian, uh, Chinese civilian enterprises, companies, which are now taking up classified research and getting involved in weapons production, and mainly in terms of joint research institutions, academia, private firms, all instrumental to further PLA's military ambitions. So in this aspect, we get to know that there are two uh, systems uh, that is operating, what China calls is as seven sons of national defense and seven sons of arms industry. These are all civilian uh, universities where they form this combination to facilitate China's defense industrial base. So your in universities or your research institutions are actually facilitating all classified research and which can take into consideration or move forward you know, with joint interactions or joint research abilities with in universities abroad. Now, for us as, you know, an outsider or research organizations, the lines are getting blurred because you don't know for what the research is meant for. So that's, again, a loophole or the caveat that we need to take into consideration that if any foreign university is engaging with the Chinese institution, we are not aware of that, you know, what this research intends to do. So there is a purpose or very much a Chinese military purpose that is lying hidden uh, in that joint research. So we need to be very cognizant of that aspect. Further, uh, in some of the uh, private players, if I can name like uh, Yucho Tech or Xi'an or Chir Technologies, they are now pivotal to China's, you know, making of China's unmanned, way, unmanned vessels, uh, drone technologies, AI, and nonetheless, Pai Tu, Huawei are already there. So we need to see this transition also in China's own setup that how the state owned industries are now not taking the uh, uh, reins in the hand, it is the private players, which is also very distinct in a, in a system like China. So the, the leadership is actually engaging the private players in this aspect. So this also makes NCF, MCF uh, very interesting and also how the politics of China is also trying to change itself in terms of thinking and operating to cater to its own ambitions or say internationalization of its political and military ambitions. So with regard to India, primarily with regard to India, uh, I would like to say that where does India needs to look at? As Sir has already enlisted that, you know, where do we lack and what we need to do? I would like to add that, you know, for India as infrastructure is one of the key areas of MCF, India needs to be very cognizant of China's infrastructure buildup in our border areas, which is happening in rampant. And we are also le leveling up our own infrastructure buildup. But specifically, I want to uh, draw your attention to the Sichuan Tibet Railways that is now, you know, in its mode of almost like it will get completed. But what is the aim? The aim is for quick mobilization of troops and logistics. Yes, there is civilian intent that, you know, you this railways is made for civil purpose, but the military purpose is far more significant in this. And given the situation that, you know, our border areas or India-China border discourse is only getting more volatile with time and it is here to last. It is no more in that state of, you know, that we are, we have not shelled a fire since last so many years. No, that discourse has changed. So 
China is ramping up its activities and also it knows that we are facing an India that is giving us a tough fight. So how do we reduce our response time, increase our reactiveness? So we need to take a focus to the Sichuan Tibet Railways. And the other aspect uh, that I just recently read, that China's uh, research is also investing in some joint research uh, with some European universities, which came into light. They are looking at mon mon monkey brain activities in high altitude. And when you say high altitude, automatically, who is China facing at high altitude? It's India. So they are doing some research on how drugs can prevent brains from getting damaged in high altitude. So this was an interesting study that got into a picture. And we are seeing the M NCF operating in this. So India needs to, I think so, dig much deeper where all, what are the areas China is investing in and where we can draw direct links to that of India. So therefore, if I put all this in one picture, it only uh, I come to the conclusion that, you know, what China is engaging now is a strategic MCF research. And for outsider like us, it literally blurs the lines for the outsider that how do you then see the intentions? The, where the civilian is very much military, I think so. For us, uh, uh, I think so, uh, the pragmatism uh, would lie if we try to give leverage more to the uh, military intentions over civil, because that is an all encompassing approach. And uh, with Xi Jinping's uh, push towards civil military infusion, uh, fusion, it is aimed uh, to build China economically, technologically, and militarily and where MCF is actually uh, acting as a linchpin towards the goal of uh, achieving that world-class uh, military status by the mid of the century, and to which one cannot ignore the risks that this strategy poses, uh, both to the world at large and India in particular, because it's invariably linked to China's geopolitical ambitions, both to protect and advance its own interests. And we are seeing a uh, China that is aggressive, assertive, and expanding its interests. So in its expansion of interests, China is also expanding its efforts under this military civil collaboration, and which it calls as fusion. And that is the area that needs closer and closer attention from India. So on that note, I would like to rest my case. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Josh, for your uh, insightful comments. I will now request General Shankar to share his observations. Uh, thanks a lot, Madam. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Joshi for his good paper. I have gone through it. And uh, my compliments also to Ms. Uh, Dr. Josh for her comments. Uh, let me put it in perspective. I've been studying this military civil fusion for quite some time. Uh, ever since my retirement for the past five years, I've been doing this. <clears throat> this is a dark hole in our strategic thought process because we really don't understand it. To that extent, I'm very happy the, and, uh, that Dr. Joshi has taken this, undertaken this research and brought this subject into the focus. Right? And this has to enter our thinking. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a background, and then I'll get on to what we need to do. Because uh, we've heard enough of what civil military fusion is. How is it applicable to India is more important for, to me than what China is doing. Right. If you look at the background of this, all great nations have gone through civil military fusion. Like what Dr. Joshi said, he cited the American example. I'll go back a little more. The Industrial Revolution and the colonial era is all about civil military fusion. That was a time when science and technology inventions in them made colonial militaries better and great, uh, gained a greater share of the world economy, and they made them more efficient. You look at the Russian model, you'll be surprised to know that the Russian defense industry and the agricultural industry have this common base. And that has to do something with the terrain. And all these three put together have made Russia what it is, the Tsarist Russia. So it's civil military fusion is not a new concept which China has invented. It's an old, age-old concept. If you 
if i give you a few examples over and above what dr joshi said usa went through a period of intense civil military fusion during world war 2 you know at one point of time usa was producing military aircraft by the hour tanks by the day and warships by the week or even less and that is what defeated germany in the end right and you look at it today the mighty military industrial complex of usa is all about civil military fusion you look at the ukraine war example there are a lot of thought processes in from uh, usa and it's on youtube which says the entire story is being driven by the military industrial complex so there is a big thing beyond just arming militaries in this mil civil military fusion it is not about making military strong but it is about boosting economies and making nations great in this century chinese have started this process in fact they are very late catchers they but they making fast progress okay now let's see what is the necessity for us we have to go through uh, if india aspires to be a great power we have to go through a process of civil military fusion not to make our military strong but to make our nation great the military becoming strong is a is a by product of this process why is it a by product of this process for what dr joshi had said most inventions in military have affected or have flow gone on gone down to the uh, civil sector inventiveness in military and the military necessity drives mankind like gps or for that matter networking whatever what many he said right but then what does it demand from us it demands shedding our own thought process we are a soft slow moving status quo is big talking nation we unless we unleash our own potential from within uh, we will not go anywhere and we also need to understand that the civil military process is a very complex process as outlined by dr joshi and highlighted by dr jesh the next thing is that this civil military fusion process and the whole strategy must suit our culture and political climate if you don't have that you'll go nowhere now the, the, if you analyze the civil military fusion or the military civil fusion call it what you want of china it is driven by its superpower ambitions and to establish a chinese based world order that's the underlying thing and for that it needs a strong military and for that it needs all this that's the hierarchy now if why is this coming to focus the usa and the western powers are dissecting the chinese model to stymie it as dr joshi had said a lot of this story has been stolen from the us model into the chinese model right now china is trying its offset policy and all that is to you know stop that but then where, what is it there for us the chinese civil military fusion model is available for us to adopt provided we can that's the uh, thing how do we how can we do that right what is should be our approach now one thing is clear that the chinese model is too autocratic for our democracy we can't handle it right we can't handle the structures which xi jinping and party have put in they have got six structures i mean i can go into the whole thing but that's a different story the second thing is we have to accept that the uh, civil military fusion is necessity is a fine necessity and it cannot be disputed like it was brought out you need strong political will and inclination to do so do we have that that's the first fundamental question to a large extent the potential is there because we have a government which can drive this process for the first time with its majority and a prime minister who has you know thought of this atmanirbhar you know the desire is evident in this atmanirbhar program but can we take this atmanirbhar program to civil military fusion and then to greatness is a question mark right this whole thing has to be driven by a unitary political leadership and it has to be backed by a bipartisan consensus that is important the political climate will drive civil military fusion and if you dissect the civil military fusion uh, you know structure of china it is a political climate because with xi jinping at the top and this uh, the implementation committee of the uh, cmc or rather the civil military fusion 
This is just next to the Central Military Commission. It's almost a parallel if you see the hierarchy. So that is important. Right. And of course, like rightly brought out, you need a whole of the nation approach. Most importantly, you have to have the ability to stay the course for over well over a decade. Why well over a decade? There will be a lot of failures. A lot of issues in this are aspirational. And a lot of it is psychological warfare as rightly brought out. Right. Things like AI, et cetera, et cetera, are very great aspirational issues, but very little practical value on the battlefield. Again, the Ukraine example is great. I have myself been dissecting it. Uh, not all technologies can be implemented in a battlefield. And battlefield still remains a violent place where blood flows and sweat and tears come out. It's a dirty place. It's an unhygienic place where hygienic computerization doesn't work. Right. Okay. Notwithstanding that, the entire story has to be self-driven and irreversible. It has to be something like what we did on our economic reforms. We unleashed the beast and that never got went back. And we are only doing more reforms and reforms and reforms. We might have slowed down, we might have gone wrong. But it is irreversible. So if you start something like the military civil fusion, it has to be irreversible. We might struggle. That's a different story. But we have to do that in that manner. Right. Now, there are certain issues which we have to take factor in before we start this. First and foremost, the primacy of the military has to be acknowledged. Is that acknowledgement there in our polity? Right? Because where you have constantly degraded your military and equated it to the you know, PMF and CAPF and all that, and where there is no inventiveness in the military left, right? And there is no connectivity between the military and the DRDO and the MOD the way it is. And that's why all our procurements are lagging. Can you do it? Again, it's a reversal of our own culture. The second thing is one we need to know civil military fusion is not about DOLUs alone. DOLUs is just the outflow of the whole story. It is about discovering technology and applicating technology to a, a use. The most important factor of civil military fusion is breaking barriers, establishing linkages and channels of communication, which again was brought out by Dr. Joshi very well. And his paper talks of it. Can we do it? Our communication lines are as it is crisscrossed. Right? So it's not as if we can't do it. The idea has to be correct, then everything falls in place. Something like what Dr. Manmohan Singh did with our economic reforms. If the idea is sold and put in place, everything will fall in place. Now, there are certain cultural issues. In, in India, everyone believes in one map manship. And everyone works to his concept of national interest. You know, if you go into the procurement process, I've been 30 years in the uh, you know government as uh, army officer. Right from the down, smallest Babu to the defense secretary, everyone at each stage of file moves has his own concept of national interest. And he applies it on file. And it, all these applications of their individual concepts goes takes us somewhere else. You can't do that in MCF. It has to be a unitary approach. So that is something which we have to look at. Then you need inter-service, inter-department, inter-ministry, inter-state, inter-party, and myriad other intercept barriers which have to be broken because they are calcified. We are all calcified beings in India. Status quo. Right? And we are now looking at a thing where it is driven by a unitary approach like it was done in Communist Party uh, by the Communist Party in China. Right? So, we have to think. But can it be done? Yes. For that, you need an empowered structure and a well-defined hierarchy to break these all these walls with a hammer. Right. If it can do that, we are well on our way. The, the, the fundamental fount for this is the Atmanirvar Bharat. I still feel so. You need a, like I said, you need a clear-headed political leadership, an unshackled military, and a bureaucracy. And this bureaucracy has to shed its lassitude and its fixations. We need a political, military, bureaucratic linkage. You need the political, bureaucratic, and uh, you know, pol uh, military fusion to start with. Unless the fusion happens at that level, the rest of the civil military fusion uh, might not take place.
Okay, having said that, let me see how we can put this into uh, play. Can we do it the Chinese model? Obviously not, we can't do the Chinese model. So what I, when I went into the whole thing, I said, we need a clustered approach. And I put out about four to five uh, clusters in the way we have to approach civil military fusion. Because if you attempt something big, you'll fall. Okay, so what are these uh, clusters? You take successful and key sectors of national importance, which I identified as defense, space, atomic energy, and communications. And these are the clusters or the, these are the sectors which are key to national security and strategic security. And these are the places where we've had success. So reinforce success, link them up. And they have inter, say, I mean, they have linkages as it is. Strengthen those linkages under MCF and maximize them because that will put you on a different level straight away. You don't have to go the whole hog. Then we've spoken a lot about AI and robotics and unmanned and cyber and all that. Now these disruptive and modern technologies like AI, cyber, robotics, unmanned, new materials and so on, club them, make parks out of them. And this is what I've been trying to tell the Tamil Nadu Defense Corridor also, and we are doing that, right? Where we can set up research parks where core technologies are exploited and where multiple users can come and exploit that core technology, right? So that is one other way where you, you have one cluster of disruptive technologies. In fact, I'd like to highlight and you know take what uh, Dr. Joshi had said, revolution ministry affairs is being driven by disruptive technologies. Today, it's no more revolution in military affairs. I feel it is disruption in military affairs, which is going to happen, right? And for that, if you don't have civil military fusion, we are going to be out of the loop, right? Then the next thing is infrastructure and logistics. So where your rail, road, airports, uh, ports, warehousing, freight services, transportation, housing, buildings, and all these can be clubbed together. These are all dual use. Look, if you can land an airplane in one of the highways in UP, right, as a runway, you can do that more. I mean, you'll be surprised to know Pakistan has been widening its runways uh, along the border for over a decade. For what? To use UAVs. I mean, we are rather late in the game. Okay. Okay. Then, of course, you need concerned ministries, uh, military departments, academicia. PSUs, public sector, all these industries, PSUs, science and technology institutes, all these have to be clubbed together. Can we do it? That's a question. But at the end of the day, I must say, focus has to be on key technologies, key products, and key personnel. You need talent and capture of talent and retention of talent and reversal of talent. It is not as if we don't have talent. Unfortunately, most of our talent is in USA and foreign countries. You have to get them back. Now, let me give you my own perspective, or rather my own experience. For the past two to three years, in fact, for the past five years after retirement, I've been in IIT Madras. I've been in the aerospace department. I've been trying to get uh, cutting edge technologies, which have been spoken of into the ministry, uh, into the defense. I find huge barriers. For me to get a project through takes one to two years. A simple project, say, about four to five crores. And we are talking of millions and billions of dollars. Unless you invest that kind of money, unless you invest that kind of effort in getting all this, it's a very difficult process. You do, do we have the capability to do it? We have the capability to do it. Do we have the intellectual capability to do it? Yes. What we lack is the drive to do it and the awareness to do it. With this, I'll... Uh, uh, you know, finish off uh, my comment. Again, I'd like to thank ORF and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Joshi for bringing this subject to the fore. Because I think, you know, the very idea that people should know about it, read about it, and research about it is the first step. Right? And to give you my own, uh, you know, experience, uh, I wrote an article about uh, this. And I'll share that link with you, Dr. Joshi, after this. I got a whole lot of 638 views on that article. Right? That's the popularity of the subject. And I'm glad this uh, you know, interaction we've had 
will probably double it. Thank you. And I, hopefully it will triple it and quadruple it in times to come. Thank you. Thank you, General Shankar, for your remarks. I will now request Dr. Joshi to briefly respond to some of the observations made by the panelists. You know, I don't uh, really have very much to say, except to, that both panelists, General Shankar and Dr. Josh, uh, what they have done is that they have kind of uh, 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 expanded on some of the issues that I have raised, and they have given some important uh, perspectives uh, on how India can deal with this. Uh, one of the things that uh, has struck me is that we have been, uh, I think, somewhat premature in in terminating the role of our planning commission. You know that uh, unless if we are going to talk of clusters, as General Shankar has spoken of, since there's someone has to do the coordination, someone has to do the direction. PMO can't do everything, you know, and. Uh, this you know road using road even simple things like using highways as uh, as as airstrips etc get, uh, getting specifications for those um, uh, airstrips has to be done that way but i think you know at the end of the day what i had described the chinese process idar introduction digestion assimilation reinnovation so india has also introduced technology i mean if you look at navy we got the uh, Leander class frigates, uh, you know, and we had ambitions, uh, you know, so that we would transform our industry, meaning we, I'm talking of 60s and 70s. Digestion has been a problem. Digestion has been a problem because we have not effectively digested some of these technologies. And uh, thereafter, obviously, assimilation has been an issue. As far as re-innovation, we have not reached that stage in many areas. I'm saying aviation technology, I'm saying we made the first supersonic jet in uh, Asia, I think, the HF-24 in the 60s. What happened after that? You know, so so there are uh, the, uh, um, what we have lacked, and this is where the Chinese have had an advantage, is that they have an authoritarian state. They have a whole centralized setup. And in that centralized setup, they are able to uh, issue orders and ensure that they are implemented. In our country, in a federal country like India, that's why I uh, raised the idea of states, that co the co coordination must also be not just between the PMO or planning commission or this thing, but also the state governments, sta uh, the state governments as well as the institutions. And finally, as I had, had pointed out, something which is very dear to my heart is the quality of universities. It's all right. General Saab is in uh, IIT uh, Madras. Uh, Amrita is in a fine institute. But you know, between Delhi and Kolkata, there's no university which is functioning or any, uh, has any value. So now, in those circumstances, uh, having great ambitions is difficult. You have to build bottom up. So I think I'll just conclude there. I, do, I, thank, I can thank the panelists for being uh, kind enough to make the comment, to read my uh, paper and to make these comments. And I hope we can uh, take this whole thing forward uh, on behalf, on the uh, so that it can benefit uh, our community of scholars as well as the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Um, any final comments, maybe in a few words from each of our panelists, uh, maybe uh, uh, Professor Jash? Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. I just want to uh, just make one final comment when we talk of in relation to India, the first step lies in bridging that big long-standing gap between civil and the military in a country. And then, uh, of course, R&D is the area where we can do it. So that, that's my, my final comment. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, General, uh, General Shankar. Uh, thanks a lot, madam. And thanks a lot, Dr. Joshi, for this, uh, for getting the genie out of the bottle. This, is bo this whole genie was bottled up. We got it out. And I only hope it uh, you know, grows further. Because this is a sore requirement for India. And uh, thanks to ORF for even imagining that we should have this subject. Because I honestly, 
I didn't get any takers. And I hope this webinar or this panel discussion has more takers than what I had. Thank you, General Shankar. And uh, we also, we are almost at the end of our session. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Joshi, Professor Josh, and uh, General Shankar for this important and insightful discussion. This has been a great discussion with plenty to reflect on regarding um, China's MCF strategy and its implication for China-India relations. We'll continue our discussions on similar interesting topics in our, fellow, uh, in our future fellow seminars. Uh, till then, thank you and bye-bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.